Well, hello everyone. I guess it's a good time to start. We have around 200 people joining by this moment. So welcome to uh, this online event by Grammarly. My name is Sasha Marinich. I am an engineering manager here at Grammarly and I lead several teams uh, working on our backends for text processing uh, and for billing and subscription services. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we were uh, kind of uh, worried a little bit whether uh, this topic will be interesting to a lot of people, but it seems like we have really, uh, you know, found uh, just the right topic to talk about today. And today uh, we, are work we are talking about uh, different aspects of engineering management here at um, Grammarly. Uh, well, uh, if you ask me uh, why we decided to have this meetup, I really think being an engineering manager in a startup that's exploring cutting edge technology and making it available for like broad masses of consumers worldwide, it's probably one of the most exciting things you, you could do in tech in general. And uh, also, uh, arguably, that's probably the least one of the lesser defined roles. Right, because uh, like the the scope of everything an engineering manager might do, could do, is like super broad. So we decided to talk about that, and um, uh, we rec we recognize that the topic has many facets to it. So uh, what we decided to do, we invited several uh, engineering managers from Grammarly and asked them to talk about their experience and to talk about uh, some of the uh, specific uh, sides of, of the engineering manager role. So uh, before we start with our with the first of our talks, uh, just a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit announcement what uh, to expect next. So today we have three lightning talks by um, engineering managers at uh, Grammarly, uh, and uh, after we are done, we will have a Q and A session. So uh, please uh, write your questions down and have them ready uh, by the end of the third talk. Uh, and please use the Q&A tool here in uh, Zoom webinar um, software. If you um, roll your mouse over the screen, you will see a toolbar at the bottom and the Q&A button. So you can submit your questions there. Uh, after the end of the third talk, we will address some of the most interesting questions. And then after the Q&A session, uh, we will do, uh, we will, uh, set up breakup sessions, meaning that um, every speaker will go um, onto a separate, um, sort of a separate call. And you will be able to join that and have just a free form discussion uh, about pretty much anything. Like, so don't worry if your question doesn't get addressed in the Q&A, uh, we will have uh, plenty of time to talk afterwards. Uh, all right. And uh, with this, we are ready to dive into the first talk. And uh, I present to you Heidi Williams, Director of Engineering at Grammarly. Uh, we have been working with Heidi together for a while now. Uh, it has been a pleasure and I'm super excited by, by the topic she is, uh, she, she is trying to explore here. So uh, have fun. Heidi, you're welcome. Please start your talk. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you all for coming today. Very exciting to see such a huge crowd. That's pretty awesome. So today I'll be talking about driving innovation and entrepreneurship and what an engineering manager's role is in that at Grammarly. So first, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the industry a long time. My daughter likes to joke that I started working in the 1900s, um, so it's been a while. Um, most of my background is in building things that are B2B. I also have a lot of experience in building developer platforms and partnerships with other companies um, that can use those developer platforms. I've worked on a lot of 1.0 products, including at my own startup. And I, I see myself as an engineering leader who is equally interested in both the business side and the technical side. So all of that sort of comes together uh, and is why I particularly love my role at Grammarly. So I, I lead the teams, not only that run the backend services that power all of our front end experiences, but I also get to work on two new things that Grammarly is doing. So for Grammarly business, 
we've always sold to consumers and individuals, but now with Grammarly Business, we are creating a B2B offering, something that will work for teams. And then on the partner platform side, we are building public APIs and SDKs that third parties could use to embed the Grammarly experience in their own SaaS applications. So really thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship is certainly my, my passion. That's what I get really excited about. How do you build new things that solve real problems for customers? But I will note that if you innovate by itself, it doesn't get you very far. You can build the coolest thing in the world, but if you don't have a way to sell it or if people don't actually need it, then it doesn't matter. So that's why as an engineering manager, I really need to understand the business context and the customer problem before I start building anything. So just a little bit about uh, what we, how we think about it here at Grammarly. So we expect that engineering managers will drive impact. So that means keeping the team focused on the most impactful work. It means driving results towards, towards that work and towards that impact and exercising judgment around their team's product and technical priorities. So if you think of those bolded words, all of those impact and results and priorities are about building a product that ultimately delivers customer value and therefore business value. So if you wanna deliver customer value and business value, you have to get creative and start innovating. But it's really hard. How can you drive impact if you don't understand the context? And I think about impact is that definition of customer value and business value. You can't really make an impact if you don't know what your customers would find impactful. So for example, who are your customers? What's important to them? Which of their problems can you help solve? How do current customers use your product today? Maybe what challenges do they have using your product? What gets in their way? And through all of that, what patterns can you find? These are the seeds for all of those ideas that you can innovate on and, and build cool things that they, will, they really need and want. So it's really critical for engineering managers and engineers to get answers to these questions so that then, then they have a frame within which they can start brainstorming ideas and building features. So where can engineers find answers to these questions? Well, there's a spectrum. So on one end, there's the qualitative. So getting you know, really concrete feedback, it might be only a few data points, but really, really concrete. So even with three to five data points, you can discover really interesting insights about your customers. So you've got your potential customers, the people you want to sell to, but haven't bought your product yet. You've got your current customers where there's maybe an opportunity to do more for them than you are today or, or to expand that current customer to similar potential customers. And then sort of going up the spectrum towards the quantitative, you have a lot more data points, but you sort of have to interpret the data a little bit. Maybe you have millions of data points, um, but you have to make hypotheses about what those data points mean. So maybe your customer success team can share trends and insights of what they're seeing uh, from people who are already using the product. Or maybe you have data about the usage of the product and the behavior that people take within your product. So, so again, on the spectrum, you've got really concrete feedback, but not as much of it, all the way to quantitative feedback where there's a lot of data, but you have to interpret it and make a hypothesis about what it means. So after that, you know, what are, what are the different ways that you can help your team get answers to these questions? How do you discover these insights? So this is a mix of the qualitative and quantitative side of things. So on the, on the qualitative side, maybe you can listen to sales calls. At Grammarly, we use something called Gong where every sales call is recorded. And it's really cool because the salespeople can tag individuals and say, listen to these, you know, this 20 seconds where someone articulates exactly what problem they're trying to solve and it's unique or new, maybe something we haven't heard before. You can also join those sales calls uh, live if you want to. Of course, you'll, you'll be put on the spot, I'm sure, to say, when are you gonna ship something? But it's always fun to interact directly and, and ask follow-up questions with customers. Another way to interact with customers is to partner with user research and product management to interview customers, or maybe you can run a survey and ask them very specific questions. You also could partner with product management to make sure that they define who is the target customer? What does that persona look like? And maybe it's based on their interviews or maybe some market research of some kind. And then you can also build systems and processes for getting insights from customer success. So this starts going a little more towards the qualitative. So you, you could listen in on customer success calls or help triage tickets, but to get more of a trend information, you could just meet with the success, excuse me, the customer success team to learn about trending topics. You can have them categorize questions and issues from Slack or from Jira. And now you can start getting more data points uh, and start figuring out where there might be room to innovate. 
And then the last one, if you have analytics in your product, uh, you can partner with data science to look at usage and behavior to get new insights. So let me give a really specific example about Grammarly Business and how we've used these techniques to gather ideas of which problem we should try to solve. So our customers, when they sign up, um, can indicate whether they use Grammarly at work or for personal or for maybe for school. And also when they buy the product, the self-serve buyers can indicate their industry and their functional role. So are they in sales or marketing or are they in customer success? We also did interviews, um, uh, sorry, for the first one, we did find that there were a lot of customers who are, were in customer success roles that were using our product. On the interview side, when we started talking to those customer success folks, we realized that their daily job is very different from, from person to person, team to team, company to company. So some of them are using chat, some of them are using email, some of them are writing knowledge base articles, some of them are doing tactical responses to questions and issues, other ones are responsible for building relationships, and then some have a very direct contact with customers and for others it's a little bit more indirect, so that um, knowledge base article as an example is more indirect. And then how they're measured at work also changes. So whether they are measured on being fast or whether the quality of their response is important, usually it's both, or maybe it's about building trust. And then on top of that, we could look at the you know, cohorts of users and figure out what types of suggestions are accepted most often. So this is all aggregate anonymized data, but what are those suggestions that are accepted most often? Which of those are used most commonly maybe in short form writing like chat versus long form writing for articles? So all of this was really interesting and, and helpful for um, as, as soon as we've gathered this data and these insights, we can start figuring out how to solve problems that are important to these particular customers. So now we have this data, we want to empower the team with this data and these insights so we can start innovating. So here are some ways that you can come up with new ideas with your team and, and test them to see which ones are going to work. So maybe you whiteboard with the product managers and start, you know, creating some ideas just from scratch brainstorming and seeing what you can come up with. Maybe from there you create a proof of concept with designers and data scientists. You can also do things that don't scale. So if you have an idea, but it would take a long time to implement it in code, you could test an analog version before you go and write any code at all. You could also uh, definitely encourage iteration. So doing user studies and usability testing. So once you have an idea, make sure that it's something that really resonates and works for the customer. I also like to talk about drinking your own champagne instead of uh, eating your own dog food, just uh, we think our product is champagne. Uh, so testing it internally, making sure that once you've, you've built a product that internally your own customers can give you feedback on, on whether it's working for them. And the last is when you're ready, you can run experiments, creating frame, frameworks to test and monitor features on a subset of existing users. So it's really important to iterate. You definitely won't get it right the first try. So let me give an example again of how we turn some customer insights and data into innovation um, again for, for Grammarly business. So once we learned how customer support teams work and how they're measured, we started brainstorming and whiteboarding with the product managers. So we said, if customers are measured on the speed and quality of their writing and also on building trust, then how can we represent the role that Grammarly plays in time saved or the number of writing sessions that were improved or the number of sessions that sounded professional. So now we can start brainstorming and coming up with creative ideas there. We did also, um, before writing any code, we did run an analog experiment. So as an example, we wanted to build analytics and give managers a view into how their teams were performing and uh, in terms of their writing and how their writing was improving. And so instead of building the whole feature, we just took the data and created a manual PDF report for customers to get their feedback on which data was going to be useful before we built the whole feature. And that was awesome because our first take at it, they said, well, it's interesting, but it's not actionable. So then we had to go back and think about how to make the data actionable. We ran an early adopter program. We enabled analytics for those customers once the code was written. And then we interviewed them along the way, both end users and admins over eight weeks. And we kept iterating and updating the feature along the way based on their feedback. And on the theme of drinking your own champagne, we then launched the, the, pre, the feature first with our own customer support team and could get really quick feedback but just by sending them a Slack or doing a quick interview um, Zoom meeting with them to find out what they thought of the analytics feature. So as a closing thought, I'll leave you with this quote, success is not delivering a feature, it's learning how to solve the customer's problem. 
As an engineering manager, by encouraging your engineers to get close to the customer and to the data, they will feel more empowered and be better decision makers on the ground as they design and build your product. So they'll be able to come up with all those creative ideas, they'll be able to innovate, but within that frame of making the customer successful and solving a real problem that they have. So now that you know they're not only building a good product, they're building the right product. And it's the right product for the customer, then you're delivering impact for the customer and ultimately delivering, delivering impact for your company. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Heidi. So that was Heidi Williams, Director of Engineering at Grammarly. And um, uh, literally, uh, engineering manager role uh, means uh, in many ways being in the middle of things, in the middle of the action. And um, Heidi has just uh, highlighted this uh, one, one side of that, let's call this entrepreneurship in the engineering manager role. And uh, now we will look at a totally different aspect of engineering management. And uh, that's actually a question that gets asked many, many times. And uh, it's, it's about, technical background of an engineering manager and uh, what are actually our needs and options around having or not having technical background. So please uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Marina Veremenko. Uh, Marina is uh, my colleague here in Kyiv, in Grammarly Kyiv office. Uh, she leads one of the, I would say, uh, so so the, the technology area of the team that Marina leads is probably one of the harder ones to figure out. Let, let's put it this way. It's not that straightforward. So the question of uh, technical background is like super relevant for Marina and she definitely has some firsthand experience to share. So uh, Marina, you are welcome to start. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Do you see my screen, my presentation? Uh, yes, okay. we see it. Cool, that's great. So hi everyone, my name is Marina Vremenko and I'm an engineering manager at the platform team at Grammarly. And today we're gonna talk about do engineering managers need to be technical? So briefly about myself, I graduated from Kiev Polytechnical University and have experience in IT for more than 10 years. And I worked in different roles, started from a QA engineer, was a de de DevOps engineer, was in different managerial position. And like fun fact for one month uh, during university, I worked even in a restaurant, which uh, brings me a lot of funny, funny uh, stories, which I still share within like company or within my friends. And two years ago, I joined Grammarly as an engineer. Uh, I joined platform team. And one year ago, I transitioned to an engineering manager's position. A little bit about what the platform team do. So we create a unified toolkit, which uh, provide ability for engineering teams to uh, simplify software delivery lifecycle. So um, we provide a toolkit, which engineers use to uh, develop things, to deploy them to production, to support them in production. and uh, we. Uh, try to allow them not focusing on technical stuff of software delivery lifecycle, but but more focus on our product. So today we're gonna cover who is an engineering manager, who is this person, and what we expect from engineering manager at Grammarly. Also, we will describe a little bit how and where technical background could help engineering manager in this role, and what to do if there is no technical background. And uh, I also will provide some recommendation what to do and what you should know about your team domain and some recommendation for platform engineering managers. So let's start from the engineering manager and who is this position? So I, I would say that engineering manager is a person who grows and builds an effective and healthy engineering team that makes maximum business impact. So what does it mean? And Heidi just covered some part of this, uh, what uh, is a part of impact, which um, engineering manager brings. And you could also spot here some parallel engineering manager, engineering team. Yeah, so, so this is a person who works and leads the engineering teams. So what we expect from an engineering manager at Grammarly? There is like four pillars of work, which is like critical for us. And one of them is uh, impact. And uh, so you, um, you need to provide a business impact and you also need to build and grow the team who also provide a customer business impact. But 
making an impact is great, but what to do if you like making an impact, but in half a year, your team are all, all just burnt out. It's not good. It's not a sustainable way of uh, like uh, working. So you need to be focusing also on team health because uh, your team is like uh, you're playing in, in long, long term role and you need to focus on your team well-being, of course. And third pillar is uh, people development because uh, it's like part of team health to to create a uh, good and, ve and very healthy environment. You need to grow each individual in your team and provide some vectors to develop. And of course, it make like uh, your team more effective and uh, able to do more impact. And as you are you working in one team, which have a lot of different peer teams around the company, you need to provide communication and collaboration transparency for the for other teams. How they should communicate with your teams? How uh, they should like interact with you? Um, what what you do? So it should be really transparent to other parts of the company. So let's. Uh, describe in a little how your previous technical background, if you have it, could help you in these pillars. In regards of impact, so if you like previously was an engineer, you definitely know uh, what is technical depth. And for example, it, um, like, it's really um, clear for you that you cannot just make in features and new work. You need to also balance it between like new work. You need to balance also a technical depth. Uh, and it helps you because you understand what is it. And also you definitely had an experience how to estimate projects, which also helps you on engineering manager position because you know how much time some project could take. You had this uh, experience in past. And also you could see some technical opportunities for your team, uh, what new technology technologies you could use and everything else. And it actually really helps you to set and balance technical priorities for your team and plan the most impactful work for your team as well. Um, the next pillar is team health. And again, if you was an engineer, you definitely know how like 30 minutes meeting in the middle of a day could break down your productivity at all. Because you had to, to um, take two hours to deeply involved in some complex work and this is switching context to a separate meeting and you need again uh, to take two hours again to to deep dive into this technical work but in opposite if you are a manager so as uh, as i am now some hour between two meetings would be like a great opportunity for you to set another meeting or like resolve some, some small five, five tasks or answer questions so if you was a maker and you know how is it you 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 need to understand that your team requires this um, environment, like flow environment to resolve the complex problems. And also if you had some previous technical uh, ground or work in your team, you could feel the team pain actually, and you could debug them and try to find the root cause of this pain. And it, it actually really helps you enable flow environment for your team. So for example, we in our team set up three days uh, every week without meetings, which uh, helps us to deliver more like concentrate work on, on uh, complex problems. And also it's, it helps you create some really uh, good processes to enable efficacy for your team. So on the next pillar is people development. And definitely if you was an engineer or you still like uh, have some engineering background, you know the industry trends in your area and you could understand how to develop people in your in your team how to what growth vectors you could set set up for them and also you could do some technical screens for new candidates in your team and if you do it like and ask technical questions you could save up to four hours for your interviewing panel which is great so again technical background here helps you hire and retain strong talents in your team and create some growth plans and vectors for individuals in your team. And on the third uh, um, pillar uh, is communication and collaboration. So you actually need to provide for your team context. You, not, you don't need to decide how to do different work. You need to provide context on what is expected, what, what we need to do, why it's expected, and when it needs to be delivered. And then you 
need to allow team to decide on how to do this. But to provide this context, to understand what amount of context you need to provide, it's really good to understand the technology which behind of this like uh, pro project which you are working on. So here again, technical background helps you. And also, if you worked in your team or in other teams, you definitely understand why scaling some internal framework worth one month of work right now, because in one year it will be like total disaster if you will not invest some time in it. And it again helps you advocate your teamwork in, in within the company and cascades understand which information you need to provide to, to the team. So how um, much of information you need to provide. So great, we understand what to do and how engineering background helps. But what to do if you do, do not have engineering background but you already working as engineering manager or you plan to work. So I would say that uh, you should not be scared because it's like a choice for you. You could be scared or you could get curious and you definitely like can get this um, experience uh, even if you are not working as an engineer. So I would say the technical background is not so mandatory, but it of course make it easier for you because you don't need to uh, invest a lot of time to, to understand everything because you already some, understand some of the things from your previous background. But what is crucial is technical mindset. So you definitely need to understand that you will learn and you need to learn new things. You need to understand how your team is working, what technology they're using, why are they using this technology, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So <clears throat> this is really cru crucial for you to understand it. And if you're like asking a question, what will be enough to know to be an engineering manager? I would say there is never will be enough and you should always like understand that you will need to always learn from your, from your team and from people around you. So that's it. And here is some like small brief recommendation for people who would like to gather more experience or get more, get, uh, more technical skills. So, you definitely need to know your team domain it, it and it depends but some basic basics you need to know so you need to understand how in if you work in an engineer you need to understand how computer works how internet works so i have a link here and you will have a slide afterwards um where uh, a lot of like great links to what you should know about computer science if you want to go deep dive but some brief information you could also find there what what you should know if you are working in front end of our web team you definitely tr need to try to understand how browser works how html works or javascript so uh, get get in touch with it maybe just uh, create some small really really simple site if you are working in backend team you need to understand what is api how data structures work or some distributed systems or if you're working in infrastructure team, uh, it's better to know about how operating systems is working. What is virtualization and some clouds? What is it? Uh, some networking basic. And it's really like a long list. It depends on what team you're working on. And here I will provide some recommendation if you're working in a platform team, like uh, the same that we have at Grammarly. So I would recommend to try and get some cloud account AWS, GCP, any other uh, account free trial and try to run some virtual machines there, uh, set up Linux or Docker just to spin it up and get your hands dirty. Uh, Google some buzzwords. What is AWS, CI, CD, Kubernetes, Docker? Try them out. Try to understand and read what is this technology? Why is it created? What's the result? Subscribe to different medium or Telegram or other channel channels with relevant information. Uh, which you like. I put here some small <laughs> uh, links which I, I use, but it's not uh, like comprehensive list, but some few recommendations. Of course, read books and watch courses. And the main thing, learn from people around you. Because if you're working in, a, in an engineering team, uh, like you could uh, gain a lot of experience and knowledge from people around you. Don't uh, hesitate to ask questions. Don't be shy. It's always like you will find out a lot of really interesting information from your people around you. Also, I would recommend take small tasks, not a urgent, critical, high priority task and complex one, which should be done in really tight deadlines, just small bug fixes or 
some any other small task where you can understand how to do a pull request, how to uh, write some small code. And uh, like if your team working in, uh, in a, if your team has an on call and support some uh, service services, some production services, or have any like um, support activities uh, for other teams, I would recommend to shadow this on call to take a look how your team is operates. This is really really interesting because you definitely can understand how your team is working, what are the pain points where it could be improved. So it's like a deep dive into how your team is working. And that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you very much. If you will have any questions, you could ask it afterwards, or here is my contact information and you could write me anytime you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, it has been a pleasure to, to hear all that. So I, I just can't help but reflect that uh, like, how, how many, again, how many different sides uh, th this role has. And um, so uh, specifically about this question about uh, technical background for engineering managers. I, I think it's fair to say that if, if you end up being an engine manager for sufficient amount of time, at some moment you will inevitably uh, run out of your technical background you will inevitably arrive at this point when you need to explore technology. When you probably, you might feel like you're falling a little bit behind uh, the engineering team or like a lot behind. So I would, uh, I would say that this happens almost inevitably, but that's probably not a bad thing because it actually also provides a lot of inspiration to learn new stuff, to, to do some deep dives, to, to explore new technology and, you know, have the team that actually can implement something in real life, what you're just exploring. So I would say that engineering manager's role is definitely a journey. It's not like, you know, a rigid set of characteristics that a person must have. Um, that said, uh, now let's uh, drill in. Let's, let's focus on one of the pillars of uh, engineering manager role that uh, Marina touched upon. And uh, now we'll have a more in-depth conversation about um, that, specifically about team health. Um, but be before we, we begin, our next speaker, uh, Anya Gluchova, she is also my colleague from uh, our Kiev office here in Ukraine. Uh, she leads an amazing array of teams. I will uh, let her uh, provide details about that. Uh, another amazing thing she has done recently is post an article on our technical blog. You can like uh, we will we will provide the link in chat, but you can also easily Google that. Uh, she she has written an article about engineering manager role at Grammarly, so it's actually an in detail account of many things that we are covering in in these conversations and much more. So I encourage you to look at that. That's def definitely uh, informative and it will help structure, uh, hopefully it will help structure your thinking about uh, engineering manager role. Yes, thank you, Vika. Vika has just posted that in, in chat here. Um, also, uh, I remind you, please use the Q&A tool here in Zoom webinar toolkit uh, in the toolbar in the bottom, there is a button uh, titled uh, Q&A. So please submit your questions over there. I see some people submitting questions in chat. I will do my best to address those as well, but it will just technically be easier if uh, the questions are lined up in the Q&A tool. So please do that. And uh, we have one more talk to go and we have a Q&A session afterwards. With this, uh, I present to you Anya Gluchova. Uh, with her talk on team health. Anya, you're welcome. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, Heidi and Marina. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, looking at the number of participants, it's cool to be here. Um, so great, let's start. Um, during the upcoming 10, 15 minutes, I will speak about team health. Uh, so I will try to outline what are the main criteria of team health and what do we do at Grammarly to achieve healthy environment. And before that, uh, let me introduce myself real quick. I have more than 14 years of experience in IT. I hold a degree in computer science and started my career in QA and test automation. For around seven years, I worked in various managerial positions, three and a half years in Grammarly, 
And I manage engineers and engineering managers behind several teams, basically all interfaces team in Kiev office. These are Grammarly editor, Microsoft Office settings, and iOS keyboard teams. And uh, I've always liked working with people and helping achieve our business goals effectively. And one specific aspect I grew passionate about was how to sustain a healthy team environment uh, within a dynamic organization uh, going through its growth. And four years ago, before joining Grammarly, I walked in our Grammarly office for the first time. Um, it was the meetup hosted by our moderator today, Sasha Marinic, and it was about uh, the culture in Grammarly. And this is where um, I first learned how Grammarly values define the basis of team members' daily interactions and, of course, resulting culture. And now being in Grammarly for more than three years, I constantly continue to see how crucial it is uh, to share common values within a team of any size, of any department or any organization. This is one of the most important things that can enable us to work effectively as a team by providing the basis for trust, collaboration, and of course, feedback. Uh, so here on this slide, I will go through the main team health traits. And first, uh, sharing our common values. More specifically, in Grammarly, we have five values and I will, qu will quickly go through them and associate um, key behaviors with each value. And also I will outline several other traits associated with a healthy team. So talking about values, empathetic. This means effective communication and collaboration and treating others as they want to be treated, to collaborate, adaptable, embracing change to evolve and succeed with a positive and problem solving attitude. Greedy, focusing and persevering to achieve long-term goals by doing whatever it takes to get job done. Ethics, this is about meeting commitments or being honorable and earning trust by doing the right thing every time, even when no one is watching. And remarkable, always be learning and humble to continually improve by seeking out mentors and learning opportunities. Among other important traits of the team health, I'd like to highlight also inclusive environment, which lead to psychological safety. Flow environment, being in the flow focuses you on what's the most important, improve your performance by applying yourself to an optimal challenge. This helps you to be more open to discovery and creativity and leads to personal development. And on the next slides, I collected the most relevant of our learnings as engineering managers into six main pillars, which we do in Grammarly. And I do really hope that they will be useful. So what to do, right? First of all, um, I'd like to speak about uh, calibrating your interview teams. Overall interview process is focused on ensuring we will be able to set up our potential new team members for, for success, right? In Grammarly, we have pretty high bar while hiring. We have around five interviews for every role. Every stage has its own interviewers. It all, if all of them are not aligned on who we want to find, we would fail setting up our team members for success. And in order to minimize the risk, we have to make sure we have clear and transparent framework about the way you think about the candidate. This will help you to calibrate with other team members in your interview teams after the interviews. And this would help you avoid situations when different interviewers had scattered opinions after. This can be just a table with some set of parameters crucial to you, which is not uh, different from any table with technical set of parameters in your expectations. This is your main tooling, this is your framework, and your goal to make sure your interview team understands it fully and is aligned with it. Uh, the next one uh, is about um, building relationships, building connections. And I mean, really a lot, invest a lot in building these relationships. This is not only about having like one-on-ones on a regular basis, in order to build trust, you have to build connections. And moreover, you have to lead by example here to scale further. You have to be curious about your team member. So for example, you can drive your one-on-ones by displaying openness and vulnerability in your conversations to facilitate empathy building and release 
some of the possible unnecessary pressure. Or during the remote, you can set up regular time slot in your Teams calendar to talk about anything but work. This helps a lot in connecting during the remote. So for example, in one of my teams, when remote started, we set up our dailies 15 minutes earlier each day to make sure everyone who wants can join earlier and discuss something outside of our usual operations. Going next, um, building open and honest feed feedback culture. So the strongest indicator of the solid team trust and sustainable dynamics is the existence of this open and honest feedback culture. A team with a high level of trust practically addresses um, issues and doesn't shy away from difficult and meaningful conversations. Also, uh, strategizing team composition with business needs. Uh, so team health includes planning the team structure, both short-term, long-term, uh, because our timeline for growth has to align with Grammarly goals. Some, some of this is hiring. Uh, some of these uh, setups, they are like more strategic and cross-functional uh, cross cross decisions. So for example, um, as we were developing features in Grammarly editor team, we knew we'd want those features to appear in other product offerings in order to provide a consistent user experience. And that this would need to happen quickly and efficiently and could potentially affect the work of other teams. So uh, to achieve this, we needed to create an independent platform those features could live on um, and that our other engineering teams could easily reuse. So we divided our Grammarly uh, editor engineering team into two sub teams with one focused on new features development while the other works to make those features available in our other product offerings. And um, next one is about transparent communication. So a short example here is that given the fact that in Grammarly, we are right now around 400 employees across our offices worldwide, we care about our transparency and ease of communication channels a lot. And while we as an engineering managers have to help ensure in all directions of our communications are effective, uh, there is always an importance and min of maintaining um, and creating the possibility for everyone, um, whatever role uh, they have to bring their ideas to any function. So for example, in Grammarly, uh, anyone can talk to our executive team or top management team directly in Slack, just sharing their ideas, feedbacks, or questions. And uh, last but not least, um, make sure your team is 100% aligned on long-term long -term goals. Um, and of course, like more short-term objectives. In Grammarly, we use uh, such framework called Objective Key Result, or OKRs. We define our quarterly objectives together with the team and product managers, and we make sure everyone is involved, engaged in this process. And moreover, uh, we'd like to have everyone to care and to worry about the reasoning uh, like behind every product goal. Uh, so that means we have to encourage our teams to feel safe and free to ask why questions against specific goal in our OKRs or in annual roadmaps. So for example, uh, in one of our teams in Grammarly Editor team, often we do brainstorming sessions together before like every quarter or uh, annual roadmap definition. And right now, this is this time, December. Uh, last week, we got together with engineers, engineering managers, product manager, uh, and um, we uh, uh, using the whiteboard and some tasty snacks. We spent around two hours uh, dreaming and sharing any ideas around editing experience uh, improvements that we want to see in editor during in a year from now. Very much inspiring. Recommend doing that with your teams. So, um, and now um, on this slide, uh, I guess with our regular tooling we use in Grammarly for checking if everything is in its healthy state in our teams, if the climate is great. Uh, so onboardings is our foundation. We have a variety of trainings for our new Grammarlians, Grammarlians during their first months. We call them Grammarly University. We have different training sessions conducted by our learning and development departments. 
but as engineering managers, we have to set up effective onboarding inside our teams and have, um, and while remote, we had to reiterate a lot and making sure our new team members are set up for success with everything, including well-established connections with the whole team. And uh, as an example here, we have an expectation for all engineering teams that all new team members will be full onboarded and equipped with everything they need during the one day to make them able to ship uh, one task to production. Uh, what else? We have performance reviews twice a year. Obviously, we have regular one-on-ones. I talked about them before a little bit. Uh, and here, what I would like also to highlight is that's also very important as you scale as a manager and you uh, continue managing managers already, you have to make sure you keep connections strong by doing skip level one-on-ones, of course. Regular check-ins on team members' career passes and checking in their goals, creating opportunities for them. We have uh, different company surveys that, of course, accelerates the data-driven approach here, measuring uh, like different team members' experience and, and engagement. Uh, I will not stop a lot on these tools. And uh, I think that most of you present here today probably have such kind of toolkit in your management work. And what I want to focus on is that, first, full without fulfilling all of the bullet points uh, I mentioned earlier, these operations in this toolkit wouldn't be that effective. They would lose their maximum efficiency. And the second, all of them should be uh, doing on a regular basis. And in the end, uh, I would say that um, team health is a like, foundational pillar to how we build high-performing teams, uh, demanding prioritization and, of course, time investment. Balancing different components of team health creates an exciting challenge for any engineering manager aiming to lead a happy and trusting team of engineers on track for personal professional growth. Although every engineering manager will have their own style and own priorities and every organization and team has its own culture and maturity, team health aspect is one of the must, like, must stay top of mind. Top of the mind. And um, that's all. Thank you very much. These are some of the contacts and the article that Sasha has already um, shared. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for the uh, presentation. All right, uh, and we are done with all of our three talks right now. And we have some time for a Q&A session. Uh, and uh, I just reminding you after that, uh, we will uh, have breakout sessions with three of us, with me, Anya and Marina, uh, just to have some free form discussion. So keep in mind that uh, it's, it's also coming. And uh, in the meantime, I will uh, let's try to address some of the questions that we got submitted through Q&A tool here. So uh, I took the liberty to generalize some of the questions because there are some common themes in there. So uh, probably, uh, and uh, dear dear speakers, I ask you to maybe provide brief answers so that we can maybe go in depth discussions in, during breakout sessions. So the first one, uh, could you quickly outline the difference between engine manager, product manager, and technical lead roles here at Grammarly? So that's a sort of a generalization of many questions here in chat. So we can take that. I can, I can take a first shot at it, um, but happy to have other, other folks join in. So yeah, so the product manager still is, is ultimately responsible for uh, why do we need to build something and, and at a high level what it is we should build. And the engineering managers are responsible for how do we build that. But I think there is a real partnership with engineering management and product management because often, you know, the product manager may have um, something that they've heard that they want to build, but engineering management knows what are, what's possible, what's feasible, and they may have insights from the technology that end up giving us new ideas of, of how we could build something or what we could do. So I think there's a really, a really close partnership and you want engineering managers to be product minded so that they can push back on product management to say, is that really going to be successful for the customer? Is that really going to have an impact? And so I think it is a partnership there. The tech lead, of course, I think is involved as well. Not every team has a tech lead, but uh, a lot of teams do. And so the tech lead is responsible for 
the the sort of technical health and the architecture, doing design reviews, making sure that how we build it is in line with the problems that we're we're trying to solve. So I think it really is a partnership between between all three of those. Happy to let other Marina and Anya chime in if you have other things to add there. Uh, I'm sorry, just for the sake of time, I suggest we rush through several questions. I guess it probably will be, you know, more, more dynamic here. Thank you, Heidi. So uh, next question, and again, that's my generalization of several questions. So um, how can an engineering manager work with engineers to set technical goals for them, to evaluate their performance on some technical tracks of work, given that an engineering manager is most likely not as strong a technical specialist as the engineer they are working with. So in short, how do we engine managers work with engineers and set their technical goals and evaluate their technical performance? How that's even possible? So uh, who, who wants to address this question? I can start here. Uh, so. First of all, uh, as an as an engineer manager, you do not set like directly technical goals for the team. You work together with your team, with product managers, with tech leads. So it's you are not only one responsible for it. You just um, so your goal is to provide context to your team, so they are are aware of what uh, our company goal. So uh, we have a really, really great transparency. So everyone in, in every team understand what our business and company goals. So everyone from a team contributes to our technical goals as well. So it's answer for the first part of the question and how to evaluate and set up a uh, growth plans for individuals who are like uh, understand technology like better than you. Yeah, yeah this is like not easy, uh, but um, still that's why it was one point in my presentation. That's why you, you need to understand technical side a little bit to understand how your team is growing because your team is growing even without you. And you need to also grow with your your team and try to understand what areas uh, you could like help them achieve and you could just be like a mentor and set up vectors uh, where you could like you, you do not need to teach your team like you need to learn this and this and this you need to just uh, make a, a opportunity for your individuals to grow so for example like find out which projects could be like challenging for this person or find out like which vectors could be interested and just set up a, a, a road for success. Thank you, Marina. And that's actually a great topic to talk about. Like, again, it has many faces because there are so many situations, so many different people, you know, different teams. So I, I suggest, uh, like, uh, now we stop here and maybe talk a little bit in depth in breakout sessions. So we have three minutes left. Uh, I've got a really interesting question here. Uh, so I, I, it's a bit scrolled up in the chat, but it was something along these lines. How do we enable a customer-oriented mindset with the engineers? Like, what, what if an engineer just wants to write code? You know, that's natural thing that an engineer is interested in. So like, how to work with this situation? And I will just take this quick liberty to ask Anya to answer that question because she works with interface teams in Kiev. And like customer-oriented mindset is the, probably one of the essences of engineers there. So what do you think, Annie? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, actually, it's also on the top of my mind always, <laughs> right? Uh, so um, one, uh, there, there can be a lot of brainstorming ideas how to make sure that team feels safe to say, like to say why we have to uh, address or why do we have to work on some product feature, right? Uh, and that, I mean that uh, the, our main, um, responsibility as a engineering managers to create this safe environment where as an example, we can put an example from ourselves by asking questions like, why do we need this feature? What, what uh, results it can, and it can help achieve us, right? We have the objective key results framework, which helps um, uh, splitting up the goal into uh, actually, what do we want to achieve objective and identifying these key results. And working with the team on uh, listing all of these key results helps us to train this um, skill to 
always think about how like what what value will bring to our users and uh, of course one more thing is that uh, we always try to be our uh, users of our products and it's usually super crucial to use uh, personal feedbacks of usage of the product while planning some work and while identifying the, identifying the priorities. Again, probably there is a lot of to speak about here. I just try to outline what is on the top of my mind. All right. Thank you, Anya. We are at the last minute officially of our allocated time. So, uh, 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 like uh, just a note to attendees, please hang on. I will provide the details for the breakout sessions, for the networking sessions. In the meantime, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Anya, Marina, and Heidi here. Thank you for for the awesome information. Thank you for you know putting spotlights on different parts of uh, engineering manager role and basically life. You know. We spend a lot of life at work doing that role. So that's kind of important to do interesting and useful stuff. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we'll see more of you when you will come up with some more wisdom on the subject. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, uh, we will post uh, the links to the individual meetings. So uh, just to remind, we'll have three meetings available with myself, with Anya and Marina. And uh, it's a free forum discussion. We'll figure it out how we handle it there, either through chat or through you know live voice. Uh, we'll see, uh, judging on the number of attendees. Uh, so uh, Vika, I will ask you to post the links again, because uh, I think they are already, oh yeah, the, the, the links are in, in chat again. Thank you very much. So you can see those are separate Zoom meetings. So this meeting will remain on for an extra five minutes, even when we will disconnect, so that you just see the links in chat and you have time to join without rush. Uh, after the meeting, we will send a questionnaire to you, just small feedback form. We are really interested in your opinion. We do want to keep these meetings coming, making them you know, more useful, more interesting uh, for you, more interactive. Uh, it's really you know, fun and it's a big privilege to share. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for being here with us. Um, see you on other online events at Grammarly and hopefully in, in some while uh, at offline events too. So be safe. Thank you very much. Have fun managing engineers, being engineers, you know, building cool stuff. Um, thank you very much. Goodbye.